week four, lesson four, a lesson about justification by faith. Um, I think um, just kind of trying to move around a little bit in the Gospels and find some parables maybe that, that uh, we kind of are familiar with and then some that we're not familiar with and try to open those up a little bit. Um, but this particular parable, I think, is one that, that we kind of know. I, I mention it a lot frequently when I preach. Um, it's Luke chapter 18, um, verses 9 through 14. And then um, we'll kind of read that and we'll kind of open up a prayer. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves <clears throat> that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Lord, we thank you again for just another Wednesday evening that we can just gather here uh, before your word and in prayer and ask that you would just open our hearts in a way that uh, we can just understand your word in a fresh way, in a new way, in a way, Lord, that excites us um, to live for you, that excites us to glorify you. We just ask, Lord, that you would just give us manna from heaven to feed us spiritually. We also ask, Lord, that you would just uh, protect us and provide for our families and put a hedge of protection around those that we love and help us to reach those that don't know you as Savior and Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so this particular parable is um, a parable that, that we often hear a lot about. And like I said before, this is something I always mention, the principles that are tied into this parable, and namely, uh, you see the publican in the way the publican self-abased himself. He, he had a, an attitude of humiliation. He had an attitude of understanding that he was unworthy even to approach God. And he, the scripture makes it very clear that he stood afar off while the Pharisee, which is this religious zealot, uh, just runs bashfully in and straight up to God and starts telling God exactly what he's been doing. Names all of his religious accolades and just continues to go through that. One thing that I think is real clear when we study the Gospels is uh, we always see the Pharisees. We always see the Sadducees. We always see those particular religious leaders. Hey, we always see those particular religious leaders constantly nipping at the heels of Jesus. Every town, city, village he goes to, these religious leaders are always trying to trap him in his speech, trying to get him to say something outside of the law of God so they can claim he's not the real Messiah, whatever it is. They're always trying to trap him, and you see it all through the Gospels. They oppose John the Baptist. Um, John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's preaching repentance at the River Jordan. They travel 60 miles on foot from Jerusalem to the River Jordan where John the Baptist is baptizing. It's a 60-mile walk. That's how passionate they were about keeping the people in Israel captivated to their system of religion that they would walk that distance to see what all the fuss was about John the Baptist baptizing all these people in the River Jordan. And you remember when they approach, John the Baptist turns right around in front of all of the crowds and says, you brood of vipers. He called them snakes right on the spot. And the reason for that was is that they had a lot of external appearance of righteousness, but they really didn't have a heart change. And what John was doing was calling them to real repentance, to genuine 
repentance that transforms the heart and real righteousness comes from that. And so the Pharisees constantly, everywhere Jesus went, everywhere John the Baptist was, everywhere anybody went that followed Jesus, the Pharisees were constantly on their trail, constantly trying to see what they were doing because they knew the longer that Christ's ministry went into that three-year mark or closer to the cross, they knew the less power they had, the less authority they had, they knew it was slipping. They knew that their religious uh, system that had dominated the life of Israel for so long was nearly at its end. And so when you, when you read the scriptures, uh, the Gospels do not paint the Pharisees in a positive light. Paints them in a negative light. Everywhere they go, you see this negative light that's painted on the Pharisees. And one thing I think is real critical, and I'm, I'm going to kind of shoot off here just for a second, is when you look at the Pharisees and you look at all of the things they were involved in, and even like this man, this Pharisee here, who is at the upper echelon, not only of the religious community, but the social community as well. In this particular culture, any time a Pharisee uh, walked into any particular store or any particular social gathering, they were always the honored guest. They were always they, they would always make a way for them, a grand entrance. Uh, they were just at the top of not only the religious society, but society itself. Everyone looked up to them as the spiritual uh, leaders. And uh, when you study the Old Testament and, and you read uh, the Old Testament law, and we, we mentioned the term Judaism, and that's just you know the, the religion of the Jews, especially in the Old Testament. And Judaism was founded by God. It was founded by God. <laughs> Uh, what has happened and transpired over thousands of years is Jews have perverted a pure religious experience, namely Judaism, that God sourced in the Old Testament Scripture. What you see today, a lot of times, especially we, we've heard about the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem and how the rabbis will come to the wall and they will wail on the wall and they'll cry on the wall or people will stick prayers in the cracks of the walls. I want to tell you that's a pagan experience. That's not, that's not a true godly experience. Um, and I know a lot of times, you know, as Christians, we step back and we look at that and say, oh, wow, look, at that's such a good experience. And it's not. That's a pagan experience. Those are Jews who have not accepted Jesus as Messiah, and they're still praying to a false god. You can't go around Jesus as son and get to God the Father. And so that wall really is, is a pagan wall. Everything that's going on there is pagan. And I know a lot of Christians, they take their trip to Israel and they, they, they just see the scenery of the, the Wailing Wall and even go up to it because it's a little nostalgic, because it's biblical. But that is not... That, as a matter of fact, Jesus talked totally against it in John chapter 4. Remember, he's talking to the Samaritan, and the Samaritan's like, hey, we, oh, Jesus says, your fathers worship on this mountain, and the Jews worship in the temple. And then Jesus says, guess what? The people that really worship the way that I want them to worship, they don't worship on a mountain, and they don't worship in a temple. They worship in spirit and in truth. What Jesus was doing there was breaking down the geographical lines that religions have placed that the only way that you can get in touch with God and somehow if you go to the Wailing Wall and you put your little prayer in the crack that somehow this special place, God hears you more than if you were in your room down on your knees praying to God. <clears throat> he was breaking that down. And so sometimes when you see some of these things, especially in the media and read some books, it, it all stems back to what we'll call Phariseeism. Not Judaism, Phariseeism. And Phariseeism is the Pharisees have taken the law of God and they have buried the law of God with their traditions, with their ceremonies, with their festivals. They have created man-made things and buried the real law of God. I took you that way because I want to tell you something when you're reading the New Testament, what you're really seeing is a fight against Phariseeism and real biblical Christianity. That's what you're seeing with Jesus, his followers, 
when he sends out his disciples into the towns and cities and villages to preach the gospel, when John the Baptist is preaching the gospel, when Jesus is preaching the gospel, it is the clash of two ideals. It's the clash of two different religions. One in Phariseeism that teaches that external works, external righteousness, your own merits, your own self-achievement can get you to heaven. And the other that says it's only by faith alone that will get you to heaven. So that's the clash that you're seeing in the Gospels. That's the great tension there is between Phariseeism and real biblical Christianity. This is where I want to kind of take a swoop right here. The modern day embodiment of Phariseeism is seven day Adventism. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to it. You might have friends that are family members. Seven day Adventism is so dangerous and they look so godly. And seven day Adventism, I mean, is almost splitting image of Phariseeism without the robes. And what Seventh-day Adventists believe, they believe everything in the Old Testament. They believe in the dietary laws. They believe in extraneous Sabbath day keeping. They believe in everything that you can read in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, the health, everything. They make that a guideline and structure to get them to heaven. And here's the dangerous part about it. When you talk to them, they'll tell you, that they don't believe that salvation is work, works-based, but every time you hear them preach, or every book they write, or every time you talk to them, it's all works, 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 works. On top of that, they believe you can lose your salvation, which even enhances their hypocritical doctrine because the first thing when they tell me is, oh, you can lose your salvation. I asked them, well, how can you lose your salvation? Well, if you don't keep the Sabbath day, I said, well, how do you get it back? The only response they can say is you have to keep the Sabbath day. If you lost it by not keeping the Sabbath day, if you lost it by a work, how can you gain it back? They have to reply with a work. And there it is. They're caught in that hole where they can't respond by grace. And so seven-day Adventism, they've got a lot of churches all over the place. They look biblical. They talk biblical. But it is the modern embodiment of Phariseeism. It is the modern embodiment of the law. And it's a different religion. It's a different gospel. It is not biblical. And let me tell you, I know five or six of them right now, and they know their Bible better than Christians. Front to back. They will take you on a spin through the Bible. And they'll have you thinking you have to uh, bow down on the Sabbath day or else you're going to hell. If you eat pork, you're going to hell. The whole nine. And this is what I often tell them. I say, listen, I have no problem whatsoever if you are committed to the health system in the Old Testament. God put it in there for a reason. If you're committed to the dietary uh, pattern that, that God put in Scripture, I have no problem with any of that. Where I have the problem is when you begin to teach people that they have to also obey those Old Testament principles in order to get to heaven. That's when I have the problem. If you want to apply it to yourself, because there is great benefit in applying what God has put in the Old Testament health-wise and different animals not to eat and such, and if you want to live that strenuous life. But when you start teaching people that those particular works and obedience to that law is what gets you to heaven, you have just you've blurred the lines where grace actually comes in, where grace saves. So seven-day Adventists, to be honest with you, they're really tricky, they're really hard to deal with, and they are the, that modern embodiment of Phariseeism. They're just obsessed with traditions and ceremonies and Sabbath days and dietary laws and every other thing. Um, one of the things that made the Pharisees so dangerous as well, they were so meticulous with the law that it made them so passionate to point out everybody else's sins. You see that through the Gospels. You see the woman who's caught in adultery. They're dragging her out of the house and literally throwing her down on the ground. And Jesus, you know, comes to the rescue there. But they, because they were so meticulous with the law, it, 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 it made them so self-righteous that they were so quick to point out everybody else's sins and they would use the law as a cloak to cover their own sins. 
And what Jesus would often do, every time he confronted them, he would usually confront them with the words like, Woe unto you, a curse upon you, are you blind guides, are you fools? And he was doing that to try to get them to understand their own wretchedness and their own sinfulness, that they were no better than the adulterer that they had just pulled out of the house. But once again, because they were so embedded in the law of God and so embedded in their traditions, it blinded them to where they thought that they were self-righteous and that hurt them because they were literally these great architects of this system of self-righteousness that all it did was give a false assurance to religious people that they were actually going to heaven when they were actually doomed. And I want to pull over real quick to Matthew 23. I just want to show was you. Was Paul a Pharisee? Paul yeah. was a Pharisee yes, and right. thankfully yeah. God... Uh, saved him, changed him, transformed him, and he was able to reach some Pharisees. He was able to each reach religious people. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, just kind of, you probably know these, but down in verse 13, this is where, this is probably the most, probably the harshest chapter in the Gospels where Jesus is confronting the religious leaders. Just kind of show you how serious this is. Um, I mean, just the subtleness in their error and the subtleness in the way that they approached their own self-righteousness, they, they kind of obscured with the pretense that they were righteous is what made their religion even more dangerous. Because not only had they had fooled themselves, they fooled everybody else that was following them. And that's why it was so dangerous and Jesus always confronted that um, head on in here, Matthew 23, verse 13. Just going on down, you can kind of see Jesus says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Verse 14, woe unto you, scribes and hypocrites. Look at verse 15, woe unto you. Verse 16, woe unto you. Look at verse 17, he amps it up even more. You fools and blind. Verse 19, ye fools and blind. Verse 23, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. What Jesus is talking about there, they had this critical way of tithing. And in, in the Old Testament law, the tithe could not, not only be financial, but the tithe could also come down to spices and, and things that they had uh, grown from a garden or for a field, that those were also a part of a sacrifice. And what Jesus is saying is you literal, literally will go down to the very leaf on a particular tree, on a particular vine that you'll throw in as a sacrifice and an offering to God. You'll be that meticulous, but when it comes to the real truth of the Word of God and the weightier things of the law of God, you just bypass that altogether. So meticulous on the small things when it comes to the bigger things. And then Jesus just continues to go down, 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 down. In verse 24, he says, You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. This is another illusion. A lot, a lot of people get this mixed up here. What they're talking about straining at a gnat, there was a, a ritual in Judaism that when they were pouring wine... They, if there was any type of foreign substance in the wine when it was aerating, gnats, mosquitoes, or anything, the law in the book of Leviticus said that that particular drink was defiled. And Judaism had this strenuous activity where when they're pouring the wine out in a cup that they would literally strain and take all the little tiny little gnats out of it so the drink would not be defiled and Jesus says you'll go through all of that I mean it's just it's just Jesus just compounding the fact that they are just so lost and then we know this great verse here, verse 25, and it kind of hits, hits the nail on the head here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean, what, the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside 
uh, then may be clean also. And he just continues to just pour it on. And this is the relationship that, or the lack thereof that you see all through the gospel between Jesus and the Pharisees. And what's going to happen here in Luke's gospel with this particular parable is Jesus is going to show us two different men. He's going to show us two different positions. He's going to show us two different postures that they're in, two different prayers, and two different results. There's going to be a lot of twos going on in here. and He's going to kind of start with um, these two particular individuals. But before we kind of jump there, I want to... I kind of want to open up something here because I think this whole parable really does uh, center around this Latin phrase, which is a phrase that, that means by faith alone. It's a very important phrase. It's a phrase that um, some Latins will put an O there, some Latins will put an A there. If you know anything about the Great Reformation, 16th century, Martin Luther, John Calvin, it was a huge push in their lives, especially we talk, we've talked about it many times, but you know Martin Luther growing up as a monk and then going into the Roman Catholic priesthood, uh, he was always taught that you could never approach God because God was this angry, vengeful God and that uh, we were cursed and doomed to hell, and somehow you had to work your way out of that through religious sacraments, through ceremonies, through traditions that the Roman Catholic Church had set up. And so Martin Luther actually came across uh, the Gospel in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. He read those verses. He was a Roman Catholic priest. The light of the glorious gospel just literally pierced his heart, struck him. He was saved. And then what Martin Luther started doing was reforming from the inside of the Roman Catholic Church. John Calvin, same thing, was a Roman Catholic. They took two different paths. John Calvin said, I can't stay in the Roman Catholic Church. I'll reform from outside. I'll attack from outside. Martin Luther said, I'll stay on the inside and reform from within. So they, these reformers took two different roads. But what they did in the 16th century, they literally transformed Christianity. Christianity, as you see it today, biblical Christianity is, is in bits and pieces because of these two men that really launched the Protestant Reformation. And when they launched the Protestant Reformation, they said, you know what? The Roman Catholic Church, the system of the Roman Catholicism, has literally had dominated the land in the 16th, and even before that, in the medieval times, the dark ages, the Roman Catholics dominated religion. And when Martin Luther and John Calvin, and two different spectrums, two different eras, uh, the Reformation was really guided by the light of what we call the five solas. And the five solas are five <laughs> Latin phrases that Christians in that time, Protestants in that time said, listen, the embodiment of Christianity and biblical truth can be wrapped into these five statements of faith. And they were sola fide, which is a Latin phrase that means faith alone. It means faith alone. They had four more... Um, Solo gratia, which means grace alone. They had solus Christa, Christ alone, solo scriptura, scripture alone. And then the last one, which was the fifth solo, which was the one that they really wanted to emphasize, was solio de gloria, which is to the glory of God alone. Not to the glory of the Pope, not to the glory of a priest, not to the glory of Roman Catholicism, but everything is to the glory of God alone. And they made sure that all of these Latin phrases had that alone behind it because they didn't want anything external attached to it. And that's what Roman Catholicism had done. And that's what the Pharisees had done. And that's what every religion outside of Christianity does. They attach something to what really only gets us to heaven by faith and by faith alone. And that's what, to be honest with you, this entire parable is centered around this one particular solo. And that is that salvation 
is by faith alone. It's through exercising faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can't add anything to that. You can't take anything away from it. When Jesus says, it is finished on the cross, there is not a period there. There is an explanation point. There's not a comma. There's not a semicolon. There's not something else you need to do. It is finished. He has paid for it. It is done. You can't work your way there. You can't put any type of merits in front of God's face. So the Protestant Reformation, it radically changed Christianity. Or let's just say it brought Christianity back to where it should have been, where it was always, where the first and the second century Christians. And so when we look at this particular parable, we're going to see a lot of this sola fide, and we're going to see that Jesus is teaching this by faith alone. But I just want to say something before we jump into that is... Before you can really evangelize, before you can really talk to someone about faith in Christ, you really have to understand the real dilemma that sinners are in. Understanding the dilemma that sinners are in helps you to be able to communicate the gospel more effectively. And that is you have to know what you're dealing with. You have to know that they're captive under the devil's power. You have to know that they're blind to the light of the truth of the gospel. You have to know that their will is captive to sin. You have to understand that they're, they're, they're literally fighting a losing battle because they don't have the strength and the power to be able to fight a system that's as strong as the God of this world. And so you have to understand the plight of human sinners and let me take you back to Matthew 5 to do that before we jump in. You'll see where I'm going once we dive into the parable. But just kind of want to set some groundwork here. It's so important. Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. There is this, this plight, this dilemma that sinners are in, even though they try to convince themselves, like we were talking about Sunday, that psychologically sinners will try to convince themselves that they're not guilty before God. Sinners have a great way of... of of, of really just feeling and thinking and trying to reassure themselves that they're going to heaven, that they're not that bad, and they're not really guilty before God, and they deceive themselves. And the Sermon on the Mount, when you come down to verse 48, if you have a study Bible, it's probably going to translate something different, but I, I, I just, I, I'll tell you what it means. Matthew 5 all the way down to verse 48, Jesus has literally for this entire chapter <clears throat> gone back and forth with the people to tell them that the law of God, the absolute standard of the law of God is perfection. If you want to live by the law, you can't break, you can't break one single jot of the law. If you break one single law, you've broken them all, what James chapter 2 verse 10 says. And right down here in verse 48 of Matthew chapter 5, it says, Be ye therefore what? Perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now stop right there. That just will shatter your mind when you read that. If you have a study Bible and it translate that and translates that mature that Jesus was teaching spiritual maturity, you need to scratch that out because that's not what was going on here. Because for all of what Matthew chapter 5 is all about is Jesus is confronting the way that people view the law of God. All through Matthew 5, Jesus is saying, You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. And then Jesus says, But I say unto you, all through Matthew 5, that's all you see. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is raising the bar of righteousness. God demands absolute perfection. Did you hear that? His standard is absolute perfection. Let me break this down for a minute. There's only two ways to get to heaven. One way, you can't get to heaven. The other way is the only way. What people will do is they'll convince themselves and they'll say, you have to do this or you have to do this or you have to do that and that's the way you get to heaven. And so... It's either by, we'll just call this self-achievement. Either you can get to heaven by self-achievement or you can't. There's no other road. It's either self-achievement or we'll just call this, and I'll just short it, 
or divine accomplishment. There's no other way. Every single religion on the face of this planet, I said it Sunday, there's only two religions in the world. That's it. There's only two. There's only one that teaches you get to heaven by divine achievement, and there's millions that teach that. So they really all fall right in the same category. Buddhism, Judaism, every single religion that teaches that you can get to heaven by self-achievement, it's all just the same religion, just different skins, different faces, different false prophets, different false teachers. There's only one that teaches divine accomplishment. And that's what you're also seeing in this story. You're seeing two different relig religions represented by two different people. You're seeing a Pharisee who feels like he can bring all of his religious accolades to God and somehow God is going to reward him with his tithing and his fasting and he's going to justify him. But then you see on the other spectrum, the publican, you know what he does? He brings nothing in his hands. He comes into the temple. Scripture says he's a far off and he can't even look up to God because guess what? He understands he's overwhelmed by his unworthiness. And do you know what that does to him psychologically? He starts beating on his chest. You see, real repentance, if it's really internal, it will activate the will to have an external reaction to it. Not necessarily mean that you need to be down there beating on your chest saying, Lord, I repent. But guess what? If you've really repented... There's going to be an external change that follows that. That grieving process that we just talked about for four weeks about self-denial, bearing your cross, following Jesus, that repentance, real repentance is painful emotionally. You don't just waltz into the kingdom, fall out of your bed and say, I'm going to be saved today. And so what you see is these two particular avenues going on. It's either self-achievement or divine accomplishment. So when I talk to people, especially religious guys that think that they studied 20 years in a false religion and they think that that's just so grandiose and I really want to tell them you just wasted 20 years on something that's not going to get you anywhere when all you can do is just repent by faith and go straight to heaven in one second. Just one second. You spend 20 years there, spend one second here, you go to heaven. <laughs> I mean, pretty easy. But we understand. So it's either you can get to heaven this way or you can get to heaven that way. There's no other way. One of these. So if you can get to heaven like this, if you can get to heaven like this, guess perfect. what you have to be? Perfect. Gotta be perfect. Yeah. You have to be perfect. <clears throat> and I'm gonna tell you why that verse 48 really means what it means. And if your Bible, study Bible, tries to translate it mature, the reason why you can't do that. Because it would make no sense because the, con the comparison here is that you would have to be perfect as what? Your Father in Heaven is perfect. That would not even fit in the translation. Be therefore mature as your Father in Heaven is mature. That would not even fit. And that would be irrelevant to the point of the context of what Jesus is actually trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount. It's his first sermon to thousands of sinners on the side of a hill, and he's teaching in rabbinical form. He has sat down, and he's teaching to thousands. And you know what his first teaching is? It isn't, oh, you know, y'all are such great people, and I just came down here to just shake your hand, and you're just such great people here. No, he is teaching them that guess what, if you think you can keep walking in this religious system that the Pharisees have been teaching you, this self-achievement system for all of these years, I'm going to tell you, you have to be perfect. That is the absolute standard of God. If you want to get to heaven by your own, you got to be perfect. Well, guess what? That's not possible. No. It's not possible. Let me tell you how far Jesus really digs here. When I say self-achievement, do you know the first thing that comes to mind? External actions, right? First thing that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. External actions. Well, you know what? I don't drink. That's good. I don't get no speeding tickets. That's good. I don't cuss. There's one. Center something. Oh, I don't cuss. I've never used the Lord's name in vain. So what does that mean? Yeah, that's a brownie point. You go to heaven now. You know what I mean? You think of, when you think of self-achievement, you think of actions. Yeah. So let me tell you, even if you lived your entire life and you never committed an act of sin, which would be impossible, 
Look at what Jesus does in this Sermon on the Mount. Go down. I mean, we could just go anywhere in here. Um, and notice, actually look at verse 20 of chapter 5, verse 20. Look who he brings in here. So you can kind of tell where he's really going after. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall what? Exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me tell you what he just did in verse 20. The righteousness of the Pharisees was this. Right? Jesus just said, if you want to get to heaven, you better exceed that. You better exceed that. Now, this is sarcasm, obviously. This yes, isn't Jesus saying, totally. you got to work your way on to heaven now, boys. What he's doing is he is fixing to set a bar so high, so unattainable, that the sinners that are sitting there are going to actually realize salvation isn't by self-achievement. It's only by divine accomplishment. This is a beautiful structure when you evangelize the people. They have yeah. to first see that they can't get in on their own. And look what he does. So look at verse um, look at verse 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. He's referring to the Pharisees, what they've been teaching. Thou shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment, right? Killing is an external action. Look what Jesus does. Look at the word but. But I say unto you that whosoever is what? Angry. Angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger. Now look what he just did. He just took it from external actions to internal attitude. Yep. Sure did. So guess what that does right there? Even if the Pharisee stands up with his little robe on and says, you know what? I've been externally pure my whole life. Jesus said, oh. You think that the law only requires external duty to the point of perfection? Well, how about this? If your attitude, if you've ever been angry, then guess what? Guilty. And then you know he goes further and further and he talks about lust. That if you even lust on a woman, you're what? Guilty. Even if you think something. And that's why he comes to verse 48 and says, Be ye therefore perfect. He's not instructing us to be perfect. He's showing people that this is not attainable. And then guess what? When you get people there, they're ripe for the gospel. When you get them to see that, they're right to go further. They're right to understand the gospel. And so, back to Luke. Back to Luke Actually, chapter 18. Actually, if you're in that first category there, you can't be humble. You can't, absolutely. No. And that's what you see with this, this fella here. So let's kind of just kind of do some, some contrasting here. Let's kind of look at their positions. We've already talked about it. First, you see there's a Pharisee here. We, we've already kind of, kind of looked at that. We kind of know what a Pharisee. That word Pharisee means separatist. That's what the, the definition of the word Pharisee it means a separatist. Um, I, I told you a little bit earlier, something you often don't hear when people <coughs> preach. They always talk about Pharisees, you know, being so studious and everything and part of traditions, and that's all true. But they really were the light of the party, if you will. Wherever they walked, they were given grand entrances. So that's how much the people actually trusted in their leadership. They believed that they were the spiritual directors of the life of Israel. And so we already know who Pharisees are. We, we, we know that they're religious zealots. We know... They really honed in on the traditions and ceremonies. But the, the opposite position is here's a publican. And the publican, as, as you know, we talked about it Sunday as well with Matthew. And Matthew, as he's writing his gospel, the gospel of Matthew talks about his call, how he was called into ministry and how God saved him. And we know that a publican, you know, it's just another word for a tax collector. And they were universally despised in their culture because they were the sellouts, right? They were the yeah. Jewish sellouts. They, they would take tax from their own people in their own land and give that money to Rome. They were the ultimate sellout. They had sold their soul literally for money. And here's why it was even worse. 
because all of the money that the Jewish tax collector was taking from Jewish people while Rome was still occupying their land, that money would go to Rome and then that money would actually reinforce Rome's armies, their dominance in the land, and so it was working in such a fashion to where Israel knew that they could never get out of that hole. They could never get rid of the Roman occupation. And, and the history tells us, 80, 70, you know what happened. Rome came in and just burned it all to the ground. And then, you know, the, 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 the Jews that didn't make it out, they fled to the mountain and they all killed themselves on top of the mountain, uh, Masada. So, I mean, it's just a publican was the most despised, despised of the culture. And here was another thing, um, the publicans, they were Jewish, and they couldn't be a part of temple worship. They couldn't part, be a part of any of the social life and the activities in, in, in the land and the life of Israel because they were so despised. I mean, they were literally almost like criminals. They were turncoats. And what they would do is, uh, it's not just taxes, what they would do is, they would buy like franchises from the Roman government and the Roman government would agree to a certain amount of money every single year. So the tax collector at the beginning of the year, he would, he would make an agreement with Rome on buying some franchises and Rome would say, this is exactly what you need to give me at the end of the year. That would never change. It would almost always be the same. And then what the tax collector would do is when he's getting taxes from the people, whatever he made on top of what he owed Rome, he put it in his pocket. And so that became a real tendency to overtax. That became a real tendency to, to do a lot of guile and a lot of mischievous stuff. So the tax collector was, was a person that Jews just despised. I give give you a little nugget here off track. Give you a nugget. I, I last time we did Life of Christ, I gave you this nugget. So you got just to give it to you. You got Matthew the tax collector, right? And then I've, I've said this many times. I love it so much. You know, one of the other disciples' names was Simon the what? The zealot. Zealot. Yeah. The zealot. And you know what zealots were, right? Zealots were the Sakari. They were. Like the religious fanatics, they, they, they love Judaism so much, they love their religion so much, and they literally ran around in robes with little hook knives in their robes, and their main objective was to kill two different people, any Roman government officials and any tax collectors. Because if you could get to the money, to where Rome was getting their money, if you could kill the tax collector, kill any Roman official, then you would be making headway and trying to reoccupy your land. Well, do you know what? Simon the Zealot, the Zealots, every time they saw tax collectors, they assassinated them. And you know what happens when the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ touches someone's heart and changes them? You can have a tax collector in Matthew, and you can have a zealot in Simon walking side by side for three years in the same circle, praying together, preaching together, and watching the miracles of God. Just a beautiful little picture there. And we'll get to that when we do... We, I've got another study just on the disciples, all of the disciples and everything that they've done in their lives and where they came from and the whole night. Just a beautiful little side note there. But so we see a Pharisee, we see a publican. Now just kind of look at their posture. Their posture is pretty self-evident. Verse 11, you see the Pharisee, he does what? He stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. And then you see the publican in verse 13 and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven and so you see the Pharisee who is standing up and you see the publican where scripture says in verse 13 that he is standing afar off and what this really represents is you see that the Pharisee is kind of he has that, that, that confidence, that self-assurance in himself, that, that pridefulness in himself that, you know what, I have done some good things in my life and I can stand right before God and look up to God in the temple and not be ashamed. But the publican understands that he's not going to get to heaven like this. He's only going to get to heaven through divine accomplishment. 
And so the publican's like, I can't even get close. I got to stand way back here and let that fool up there think that he's confident in his own self-righteousness. My posture is going to be far away. It's going to be self-humiliating. It's going to be a posture of surrender and humiliation, and I'm unworthy and I'm not deserving, while the Pharisee's posture is full of self-confidence and pride and ego. And you see it in their prayers. Look at the prayers here. Look at the prayers. The Pharisee, he prays, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners and unjust and adulterers, or even as this publican. You can just imagine the tone here. The publican is afar off, and this Pharisee is praying to God, and the last thing the Pharisee says, and yeah, this publican back here, I'm not like him either. I, I'm not like any of them, God. And you see, once again, in the prayer, there is just this filthy pride, this filthy ego that I can just approach God any type of way and my posture can be that I can be proud with myself and what I've accomplished and most of all that I'm not like another publican. I want to tell you something, and this might hurt a little bit, a little, little bit of rebuke here. Sometimes we have to be very careful with this type of attitude. It can be real easy when you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years and you've been studying the Bible, and you've been praying, you've been going to church, and sometimes you look at other people, maybe in their life situations, and you might not say it out loud, but you might think it in your head, and I'm not like those people over there. I'm not like that. And I'm going to tell you where I see a lot of it. And I'm not talking about in our church, but I encounter a lot of it when I go into the prisons with the staff. They look at me, and they're like, why in the world would you ever come back here and preach in a prison? Are you nuts? And, and that mentality is, we're not like them. Oh, you're not, are you? Well, you're talking about your actions or you're talking about your inner attitude and desire? Because guess what? The people in prison, they're in prison because they sure got caught because of what they did externally. But you know what? You're sitting up here in this booth and you're looking at all these little prisoners running around and you know what's rolling around in your heart? Hate envy, murder, adultery, and you ain't no better than the ones you've got locked up. <laughs> and it's that attitude, I'm not like them. And if you have an attitude like that, you will never get close to God. Because that's the whole definition of grace. Grace is dispensed and channeled upon people who don't deserve it. And everybody no one deserves grace because we're all sinners. We got that. We know the gospel. But this is an attitude that you, you see in some Christians um, that, that, that claim to be so spiritual and so mature in the Lord, but yet you want to reach out your hand and, and, and greet someone that doesn't look like you or dress like you or talk like you or doesn't live in your own zip code. You're just ashamed to just say hi to them or give them the gospel. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not what Jesus taught. And this publican, well, look what the Pharisee says. I fast twice in the week. That was usually for the Jews in Judaism. That was usually on Mondays and Thursday. They would fast Mondays and Thursday religiously. Um, they had two particular days, those days set aside. And then he says, I give tithes of all that I possess. You know, just once again, his hands are full. He's coming to God with his hands full. He's got a whole bunch of... What's that great hymn that we love to sing? Um, Nothing to the cross I bring, only with my hands to the cross I cling. That, 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 that gospel hymn where it says, Nothing to the cross I bring, you have to come to the cross empty-handed. You come to the cross with anything in your hands, all you're doing is protecting that you have some type of works or merits based on your own self-righteousness, and God will not honor that at all. The publican, his prayer, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. People often ask me, why I tag the altar call so much and the owl invitation so much. You know what I think real 
aisle call or altar call is right there. This is real altar call right here. When I talk to a sinner and he says, well, what do I need to do to get saved? I give him the gospel. And he says, well, isn't there a prayer that I can pray? And you know what I tell him? You need to pray and ask God to be merciful to you. That's what you need to pray. You don't need to pray some prayer that I just made up that you follow me in. You don't need to pray some prayer behind a track. I'm not saying those things are bad, but I'm saying, listen, why in the world would I go to a track or a book or something else another man has made when I got it right here? This is 100% accurate and sure. I'm going to put people in the path of what Jesus taught and what Scripture taught. And so when I have someone at the end of a service, like a couple weeks ago, a guy came at Landark, came after the service and said, listen, I need to talk to you. I, I don't think I'm saved. You know what I do? I sit down, I pray with him, and I encourage him to cry out to God and ask God to be merciful to him that he's a sinner. I can't do that for him. And, and here it is right here. You see that this publican is beating on his chest because he knows he's a sinner. He knows he's broken the law of God. He knows that God's law demands absolute perfection and he cannot carry that law out to perfection. So what does he do? He beats upon his chest and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let me interpret that. The sinner has to throw himself headlong at the mercy of God. That's how people get saved. Not coddling them, not telling them to raise their hand, not say repeat a prayer. And I'm not saying salvation can't happen that way. What I'm saying is that I don't ever want to modify the way that the scripture shows us to evangelize the lost people. So that's why I don't do it. I used to do it all the time in the prison. I get 100 people come down and I have this little ego about myself. And I know what pastors get into. I know I'm a pastor. I pastor two churches. I know exactly why they do it. I know exactly how it makes them feel. They preach a message. They preach it hard. And then they do the altar call. And if they get five people to come out, it's like, yeah, I preached a good message. <laughs> it's that self-exhilaration there where you measure, you measure the production of your message by the response. And guess what? That is the absolute reversal of why we preach. I don't preach to get you to respond. I preach that you might look to God and respond to Him. I'm not a mediator. I want you to respond for the gospel, but I want you to respond in light that He has convicted you, not that I have said something. And so that's why I kind of harped there a little bit. I, I think it's just, uh, once again, I just think it's a little, you can just, I think you can produce generation after generation after generation of Christians who really aren't even Christians. That is an oxymoron. That because they've said a prayer. And then you know what the church winds up doing? We have to counsel those people that have gone from church to church to church, from city to city to city. I've met hundreds of them. I've got, I, Got saved at the Methodist church. Got saved at the Baptist church. Got saved at the Pentecost. How many times did you get saved? I got saved four times. I've actually had people say that. Amen. Have no understanding what salvation is. Because what? I said a prayer. I'm going to jump off that because I don't want to harp on that too long. <laughs> but this is what I encourage people to do. Cry out to God. Sometimes I even encourage them to go to the Psalms. You know what you see all through the Psalms? Crying out to God. <laughs> Crying out to God. You see Psalms were... Where, where men are crying out to God, asking God for forgiveness, asking God to cleanse them, asking God to search them, to try them. Contrite hearts, broken hearts open to God. And that's what you see in the public, and that's why I'm kind of harping on it. You don't see the public and running down to altar in the temple and grabbing it. You see him crying up to God. Well, here's the result. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why is that? For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. So I want to open this up just, just for the last couple minutes we've got here. Just kind of give you some easy stuff to think about. Use a different color. So, justified.
fancy little 50 cent term that's really important. Um, great theological term that's the basis of our salvation. Let me, let me just kind of give it to you kind of just in plain English. So in Bible college, my professor used to say, just, just think about justification like this. It's just if I never sinned. That's what he said justification is. And that's exactly what just, just if I never sinned. And so justification, now I want to be real clear here because this is very important. This is at the heart of the gospel and the heart of what the reformers push so hard for is justification does not mean this. Justification does not mean that you never sinned, that you never were wicked, that your whole life of sin, that just all of it happens as God says, you know what, you never did it, never happened. That's not what justification is. Justification is God granting you eternal life based on His grace by exercising saving faith and giving you full forgiveness of sins. That's what it is. So it is a clean slate, but justification is God adjusting your position with Him. So your position before justification is you are an enmity to God. Romans chapter 5. When you exercise saving faith in the cross, God changes your position with Him spiritually. Now you have a relationship with God. So justification is God changes your position. Sanctification is God changes your nature. Mm -hmm. Glorification is God changes your address, your mm -hmm. destiny. Good little way to kind of keep some of those things in check. But justification is at the heart of what Jesus is going after here. And that's why I opened up with that sola fide. Because the only way that justification is appropriated is by what? Faith alone. Now, what does justification bring? How is justification put into practice when we're saved? Now, this is really important because this, once again, is at the heart of the gospel, and it was at the heart of what the reformers taught. So, there's a transaction that takes place. Once a sinner exercises saving faith, it's called what we call double imputation. Imputation is just a big word. It's actually a banking term. And it means, to, uh, it means to credit into someone's account. That's all imputation means. It means to credit into someone's account. It means to take something, put it into their account, something that they don't deserve. So at the cross, there was a double imputation that took place. And here's the imputation. Is our sins, our wretchedness, all of our shame against the glory of God, everything that we've ever done in our entire lives, breaking the law of God, living as a sinner, all of our sins were accredited to the life of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then the double side to imputation is, by faith, when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, all of His perfect righteousness, all of His purity, all of His holiness, all of His righteousness, everything that was perfect about Jesus, all of that is imputed to the sinner. That is the double imputation, that is the transaction that occurs. Your sin goes to Christ, and Christ's perfect righteousness goes to you. And that changes your standing with God now. Here is the beautiful thing about it. How can God be just, and justify evil, wicked sinners? How can he be both? How can a judge be an absolute just judge, uphold his law, and justify those who have broken the law at the same time? Right? That's the argument in Romans. That, that's that great theological tension in Romans. And here it is. I'm going to tell you exactly how he can do it. The double imputation is that the sins of you and me, those who believe, is imputed to Christ, and therefore God demands that His wrath, His judgment be poured out on Christ, not you. So guess what? He is now fully just because we've broken His law, but our sins have been imputed to the cross, and therefore He judges our sins on Jesus. So guess what? He's fully just. 
He retains His holiness. He retains His righteousness. He upholds the integrity of His law. And then guess what He does? He's able to turn right around and justify the wicked because Christ's righteousness is imputed to the wicked. That's cool. <sighs> totally cool. Man could not make that up. <laughs> couldn't do it. He couldn't do it in a million years. So when you think about how God could be just uphold his law, retain his righteousness, and not compromise the integrity of his law, and at the same time be able to forgive sinners, how the just can also be the justifiers because of the double imputation that took place at the cross. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus is telling this publican. You have approached me in a way or you've had a broken heart, or you are contrite, you have brought nothing in your hands, and because of that, my righteousness is going to be imputed to you, and all of that tax evasion stuff that you've done, I'm going to forgive you for all of it, all of the sellout that you've done for y'all, I'm going to forgive you for all of it, and now when God looks down upon the public, and God sees the righteousness of Christ, therefore he doesn't have to execute judgment on the past sins of the public. Just marvelous. And that's the heart of the gospel. That, that's the heart of what it means. That's the heart of Christianity. That's the heart of it. And here, this is why the self-achievement, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here, this is why the self-achievement is so dangerous. Because guess what? It doesn't allow God to occupy the position of just and justifier at the same time. Because guess what? If you think that you can get to heaven by self-achievement, guess what God's going to do to you at the end day? He's going to pour out wrath on you. He's going to judge you. He's going to execute you because you can't get there by your good deeds. Therefore, guess what? All God's going to do in your life is just be just. Hammer down justice. Hammer down righteousness. Hammer it down. and You'll never be justified. Never experience the justifying experience of grace because you'll never come to Him the right way. Just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And let me just do this. We'll close up. I can go days with this. So, <laughs> imputation, imputation, you're negative. We'll just say negative bank account here. Let me show you something. So, negative bank account. Imputation bank term. And it actually was a bank term even in that culture too. So this is the center. The center is negative. Negative bank account. He is in the hole as far as you could ever get in the hole with God spiritually. You want to know why? Because he's lived a sinful life. He's sinful, 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 sinful. He's guilty before the law of God. And guess what? He's got a big fat overdrawn on his spiritual life for the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages. What he's working for. You know what God's going to give everybody who doesn't exercise saving faith? You know what God's going to give? He's going to give out a little paycheck at the end of time. And that paycheck is going to say death. You want your wages? You lived your whole life and you did what you want to do. Here's your wages. Let me sign it right now. Death. That's your wages. That's what you get for working your whole life, living sinful. Watch this. When you're justified, when you're justified, that negative comes flat. Comes flat zero. You don't owe God anything. Not guilty anymore. Watch this. This is why this is so important. That's justification. All God does in justification is turn your position to Him, and now, guess what? You're fully forgiven for your sins. Clear it out. In imputation, what God does is deposits all of the riches of Christ's righteousness into your account. You're not no more at negative. You're not no more at flat line. Now you have been deposited in your spiritual account all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And here's the greatest thing about it. What bank would go to any person who's in debt to them and say, hey, just want to let you know you're a million dollars in debt. And you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to give you the million dollars to give back to us so we can clear you out of the debt 
not just clear you out of the debt, and then we're going to give you another trillion dollars on top of that to make you rich. That's exactly what God just did. We're indebted to God. God paid it off with the blood of His Son. And then not only did He do that, He took all of uh, all 30 plus years of Christ living a holy, pure, righteous life. That's why I always say Christ not only died for us, He lived for us. All of that righteousness, all of that purity, every single time that He could have been tempted to do something wrong, to lash out with a bad attitude, and He didn't. All of that tension, all of that fight, everything, all of that combined is deposited in your account and my account, and God looks down on that as holy and righteous. That's a bank paying off a debt and then giving you more money on top of that. There's a lot going on. <laughs> These, that's why the parable here is just it's so rich. It's simple. It's easy. But this one parable is just the heart of the gospel all through it with sola fide, faith alone, and what justification means and imputation and I tell you what, I kind of sometimes when I read the Gospels and I study, I kind of try to think just objective hermeneutics and think about what maybe the people thought about when they were in this error. And you know what? It probably was an impossibility in the minds of the people before the cross where they were thinking in their mind, how in the world can man actually be right with God? You have to think that's on their mind. They're walking around, they're living in this religious system that the Pharisees have kind of built into the fabric of Israel's life, and they know it's not right. They, they know they're still guilty before God. They know they're still not forgiven because you know what? Every time they see a lamb go to the temple and get sacrificed, that was just a reminder that they were not really fully forgiven and atoned for their sins. Every time an animal got sacrificed, that was just another reminder. Like Hebrew says, not one animal, not one drop of blood could ever be fully forgiven or atoned for anyone's sins, only the blood of Jesus. That had to have been going through their mind. How in the world are we ever going to be right with God? And then Jesus preached it. This is how you're right with me. You're right with me by coming to me humble, broken, contrite, beating on your breast and saying, Lord, be merciful. That's your altar call. That's your raising your hand. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only hand raising I believe in. <laughs> so, beautiful story. Beautiful story. And it's, like I said, it's, on, it's really on the heels of him dealing with the Pharisees in chapter 17. But that's kind of how it opens up. But any questions? Any comments? Any responses? <laughs> New light shed. It's one of the best visuals I've ever seen. Oh. Ever. Well. So I've been at this a long time. <laughs> so then just in the short without having to get a long answer. Oh, that's, that's impossible. <laughs> is uh, then anybody before Jesus didn't go to heaven? Absolutely they did. Okay. okay. So, but none of them lived perfect. Mm -hmm. None of them could have lived perfect. <clears throat> they lived the best they could. Mm -hmm. So... You, you know, even like the Pharisees, if you're going through that then, is you got up to the Pharisees and they were doing everything they thought was correct yeah. in the law, uh -huh. and there's the law. Uh -huh. So if other people who weren't even Pharisees went to heaven, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, then now all of a sudden, like when we're talking about it now and you're talking about after Jesus, uh -huh. then the Pharisees are bad. Uh -huh. But before Jesus... The Pharisees were good. They're still bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you know what I'm saying? They're, yeah. they're doing the law, and, and that's how you had to get the law. And now Jesus, when Jesus got here, he says, even if you did the law, you have to be perfect. Right. Well, none of those people before him was perfect. Right, and that's a absolutely why, I remember, we started with sola fide? Yeah. Salvation has always been my faith from Genesis to Revelation. The Old Testament, Abraham was justified, Genesis chapter 15, by faith. By faith, by faith, all through the Old Testament. Yeah. Salvation has always been the same. So in the Old Testament, people were saved by believing in the future of Christ on the cross. So they, they were saved by looking to the future. And guess how we're saved? By looking at the past. They looked to the cross in the Old Testament. They believed in the symbols and shadows of Old Testament prophecy 
where Exodus and the lamb, the blood being put on the lentils, you go into the house, the death angel passes by, those shadows, those types, them believing in obedience to those particular commands, that's how they were saved. They were saved in looking towards the future. Even the, the instance with Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham taking Isaac to the top of the mountain of Moriah, and he's about to sacrifice. Just a, a great shadow of the cross. Father about to sacrifice. Son. And then the angel says, stop. And what does he see when he looks over into the bushes? which is a symbol of the Lamb of God that would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And that's why Genesis 15 is real clear about salvation by faith. It says in Genesis 15 that, that Abraham was justified by faith. Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5 are really good chapters about how Old Testament saints were saved, how they were justified. Um, and it's always been the same. What the Pharisees failed to do, the Pharisees failed to believe the message that Christ brought. Because the Pharisees, a sect, I will say, a sect that started off in the Dark Ages as a sect who really was zealous for the law of God. So that 400 year period between Malachi and Matthew, the Pharisees, that sect arose in those dark ages, in that 400 years of silent years, where they really were studious and really held to the law of God. That got perverted as the New Testament started coming around, where they started literally just, like I said, burying the law of God with all of their little side traditions. And even today, you got the Mishnah, and you got all kind of Jewish rabbinical books and laws and stuff that you have to abide by. So the Pharisees by Jesus' day, were perverted to the max because they were still teaching the self-achievement. Right. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it teach self-achievement get you to heaven. It's, and that's another thing. Salvation has always been the same from Genesis to Revelation. It'll never change. It doesn't change from dispensation to dispensation or from Old Covenant to New Covenant. Romans, the whole book of Romans is actually a beautiful picture of that. Uh, just kind of, it sums that up. Um, and that's, once again, you would think that the Pharisees, who were so studious about Judaism, right? Well, guess who their forefathers were? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Yeah. So while they're holding Old Testament and holding the Old Testament traditions, you know what they're reading? They're reading stories about their forefathers being justified by faith alone. <laughs> you would think they would get it. But they didn't, and here's the reason why. It was power and control over the life and system of Israel. Okay. They had built a perverse um, religion in Judaism that had just subtly, subtly modified the message of the Old Testament to where they could gain control over the people. And Jesus was trying to break that control, and they just would never get out of it. But um, yeah, that's a good question. Romans 4 and 5, though, those, two, those two chapters are really good with that. Especially about Abraham and how righteousness was accounted to him in the Old Testament. What we just talked about, that same imputation, that future imputation, just him believing in the cross, he was saved just in that. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Y'all got anything? I look wore out. Now where you at? <laughs> I get passionate, I'm sorry. I just get, get the loving it. You know, I just, We're glad. I just okay. never had the scriptures opened up like you do it, and I do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you for the prayers. I, I need the prayer. <laughs> I need the prayer. Sometimes, you know, sometimes a Bible study is, you try not to preach like you do on Sunday, but then once you get a little further into the, it's just, it gets a little difficult. I think I read about yeah. the Seventh Day Adventists and yeah. that Kingdom of the Cults. I think Kingdom of the there. Cults. Yeah, that's that's what interesting. I do have great the book. book. If anyone is really interested in Martin, saving um, some of these, Martin, <laughs> Martin, I forgot his first name. Uh, I don't know, but I do have book. the book. Yeah, that's a good book. Kingdom of the Cults is a good. Uh, book. It's heavy, and, but yeah. it's a very Ellen G. Very White good. is the the prophet for Seventh Day Adventists, and um, we. We took all that stuff on apologetics at Moody, and it's some rough stuff in there. You know, I read it because I thought they were one of the more religious of the 
you know, Protestants that were around, and I just like, oh, I had no idea. I will tell you this, and this is this is no slight to anybody. It's just the truth. They were probably the biggest protagonists when I was in prison. Oh man! So, young guys. You can just imagine this young 20, 21 year old kid getting dropped off at a prison that has 5,000 people in it, and they got these kids have life sentences, never going to get out, 20 years old. Their mom, brothers, or sisters are bawling their eyes out. They know they're never going to be able to be in the free world with their kid again. So, you know what they're praying? They're praying and hoping that if he's going to be in prison the rest of his life, at least God can get a hold of him, God can change him. And at least that'll change his trajectory spiritually. You know what happens? It's like a fight. The minute the buses come in, you see all the buses come in, and immediately you see all the religious people. They're like, yeah, they're just looking. They're waiting for the guys to get off the bus. The Muslims, if it's a black guy, automatically they're pulling him. No race intended. It's just the way that it's set up inside the prison system because a young black kid is going to listen to the heat and wisdom of an older black guy in the prison system before he will anybody. Because there's so many games and so much stuff going on there, and usually it's the Muslim guys, because the other black guys, they don't care. They're living prison life. They're doing whatever they're doing, gambling, playing basketball, football, whatever it is that, that, that every other person does. It's the religious guy, the Muslim, that's sitting there waiting for the young black guy because the Muslim guy wants to pack his religion. Because in prison, the more people you have in your religion, the more benefits and freedoms you get in the chapel. Mm -hmm. So if the Christians only have 10 or 15 people, they might get to go into the chapel on like a Wednesday for an hour or two. But if Muslims have 100, then they have leverage to say, hey, well, you know, you got to set up some guidelines and set up this and set up that. So it's a big push inside of there. And the Seventh-day Adventists are some of the biggest protagonists against biblical Christianity inside the prison system. I don't know how many young guys I pulled in, I don't know, it's not exaggerated, probably hundreds in the years, and just pulled them in and said, hey, listen, um, you know, listen to the story, listen to what they've been through, listen to where they're going, listen to, you know, their background or whatever it is, and just try to be authentic with them and say, hey, you know, I don't know you, but I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. You know, I might not have a life sense, but I'm close to it, you know. And, you know, just talk to them and, and, you know, just be friends with them. You know, in there, there's always the tension between people are always thinking you're going to try to take advantage of them. Yeah, what some, you want. Yeah. Anyway, emotionally, physically in there, financially, whatever it is. And so people are still kind of standoffish. And so I don't know how many times I've talked to young guys and say, hey, why don't you come to church with us? Come to chapel with us on Sunday and just try it out. You can sit in the back pew. I'll sit back there with you. We'll sit down back there together. And you ain't got to sing. Just sit there. Because I just want to be exposed to the Word. I don't know how many times I've, I've taken a young guy and had him come to church for two or three months. And the next thing you know, he misses one Sunday. He misses two Sundays. And I'm like, God, where is he at? And then, you know, a prison with 5,000 people, I mean, you might not see that guy for... <laughs> six months. He'd be on the side of the compound. And the next thing you know, you're going to chow one day and you just, you see him in front of the seven day Adventist leader and they're chit-chatting, talking. See, in the prison system, everybody knows kind of the, 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 the more spiritually inclined, the more knowledge inclined people. So there's always like leaders like, he's the Muslim guy. That's the guy that if you ever just stay away from him because he might convert you if you're not stable in your faith. That, that's, that, that's how religions are kind of viewed in there. Like, there's the Christian guy, the Christian pastor, and there's the Muslim iman, and there's the Buddhist guy. And so when you see a guy that's been coming to church for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and all of a sudden he's chit-chatting with the Seventh-day Adventist leader, you know, he's in pool. And the next thing you know, he's got him... Not going to the chow hall. Not eating bacon. Not eating stuff in the chow. Seriously, not eating stuff in the chow hall because he's teaching them that the Bible says, hey, if you want to get to heaven, you better stop eating that. It's that serious. It's a fight over people's souls in there. And Seventh-day Adventists are the biggest protagonists against biblical Christianity. You already know Muslims are going to do it. You already know Buddhists are going to do it. You already know Hindus are going to do it and everybody else. But the Seventh-day Adventists are so close Jehovah's Witnesses, same thing. Right. They're so close 
that it's hard to stand and fight against that because you got, especially if you get to a prison, like I've been to prisons where I was outnumbered by hundreds. Well, there was just like 20 of us, and there was like 307 day Adventists and 150 Jehovah Witnesses, and we got a little circle on the, on, on the yard. We're just praying together. <laughs> We're saying, Lord, please, this next bus that comes, drop off 50 Christians. <laughs> we just... We're, we're like in the Reformation. We're going through it. <laughs> but, uh, but it's those times that really, I, I'll be honest with you, I enjoyed those times more than I did times where, you know, my chaplain comes to Lanark, the chaplain at my last prison I was at at Wilcoe CI. He's, he attends Lanark Church. He's been there for two years. And so... Um, I mean, I taught four classes a week with hundreds and hundreds of people. And it was great, and we loved it. And like to see people spiritually, you know, just go in the right direction. And, and I love those times. They were satisfying. They teach you a lot. But I also love those times, like when I was at FSP and Stark, and, and, and there was only a handful of us, and, you know, something about prayer seemed more sincere, and, and, and evangelizing was, you know, it was just that you had to really... You had to really get it, you know, you had to really study and really pray, and it felt like those times is where you really, versus, and I think God did that with me at different prisons. I've been to more than 10 prisons in the state. They kept transferring me because, you know, I'd either tell the captain he needs to get saved, and he'd put me in the box, you <laughs> know, butt naked, and send me off somewhere, or I never got in trouble, trouble. It was just always something with this, you know. <laughs> Anyway, had enough that's vomit. another story. We'll be here. Let's, <laughs> let's leave that. So. All right. Well, we'll um, um, God knew where you needed love to Love y'all. Thank y'all so much for, for <laughs> putting you. up with me. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no. Appreciate and, um, anybody, it. Anybody want to leave us out in prayer? You feel some of that? No, we're close. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lord, it's been so good to be here just thinking about what Jesus said, and what it meant right there in that culture, what it means to us today in our world. And Lord, our takeaway is that we are so humbled, we are so, so pleased that you chose us for no reason, nothing that we have done. It's totally by your grace. We could just be so easily on the outside if it weren't for you touching our lives, yet we're in here just rejoicing and what you did, the exclusivity of the work of Jesus on that cross is what we've heard, and we get that. And to the world, people that haven't been impacted by your spirit yet, or they don't get it, and so many are working diligently some, and their eyes are blinded. And just to think that you have opened our eyes and let us see and that you revealed yourself to us is just amazing. We thank you. We are so grateful. We pray that we would live like that as we leave this place. Thank you for the word that's been shared. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.